Um, there are a few of you here. I'm sure more people will join as the night goes on. Um, if not, there will always be the on-demand version. So let me go ahead and introduce our uh, live session expert tonight. I'm Alex Pierenboom. I'm excited to have him here. He's a search strategist with Anvil Media, one of the um, primary, like premier, I would say, uh, digital uh, agencies here in Portland. Very excited to have him. Um, his specialties include search engine optimization, search engine marketing, social media marketing. Um, so we're going to open this up to Q&A, everyone that's here in a moment, but I do have some great questions to get things started. And, um, you know, Alex was astute enough to realize uh, th that there are some restrictions on some of these platforms around advertising alcoholic beverages. So. I'm going to, my first question, Alex, to you is going to be, can you um, share with us what the restrictions are for AdWords and Facebook and other, perhaps other uh, paid uh, advertising platforms around advertising al alcoholic beverages and um, give us some kind of information around the guidelines and what, what these people need to be aware of when they're thinking about advertising? Yeah, definitely. And it, it's, it's a good, um, opening topic before we get into any type of strategies or how it might be helpful um, because when you look at alcohol related products or um, brew pubs things like that alcohol tends to have greater restrictions on what you can and cannot say or have in a display ad versus other types of products um, so it's going to vary by platform um, but in general um, some of the rules that that are included um, would be any type of ad, whether that's a text ad or a, a visual display banner ad, um, any type of ad that might be targeting those that are under the age of um, 21, or if depending on what the drinking age is in the country that you're trying to target ads in, uh, any type of ads that have to do with um, females in pregnancy, um, anything that has to do with misleading or untruthful um, information about the effects of alcohol. Um, it can't be um, it, also typical to like what you see with TV ads. Uh, you can't show people drinking in excess, um, either large amounts or drinking really fast. Um, and then also you can't have anything that is associated with operating any sort of machine or any sort of vehicle. So, um, and that's usually the same across the board. I reviewed some uh, policies with like Google AdWords and Facebook, um, and those typically tended to be the same things. But one of the most important things is that if you're looking to advertise is review all of the rules for the platform that you're trying to use, because there can be some variances in terms of what you can and cannot do. Um, so check the Google advertising policies, check the Facebook advertising policies, um, and take a look at what they say. Uh, so then in the end, what you get is, you know, what you can do uh, tends to be more ads that are very generic. So if you're just starting out and you're opening up a brewery or it's your first restaurant, you might be able to have some ads that just say, you know, we're open, we're a new business in the community and we invite you to come to our, uh, our business, or if it might be related to some specific event, let's say that you know, you're hosting a fundraiser um, at your new restaurant, and as, I think as long as the ads don't actually relate to anything that's alcohol related, you should be okay. Um, and one of the last things I, I'll say is that when you're looking to advertise, um, something might not be approved the first time that you do it. So then it's just a matter of, you know, making some changes and trying out revisions um, and maybe kind of scaling back that original uh, content that you had. And it, it might be approved the next time. So there's always some testing that has to go on with what Google or Facebook might allow. Okay, um, excellent. And, and you know, it's interesting. I, when I was doing my research around this topic, uh, for this week in terms of kind of paid search advertising and, and um, beer. I did see quite a few large beer brands <clears throat> that were buying AdWords campaigns. <clears throat> in fact, I, I found one uh, campaign that was buying um, their brand name. I think it was the Belgium Brewing example that one of the students gave in their discussion question. And they had bought, they had, tar they, um, had bought their brand name for Google AdWords and it was the first sponsored result when I typed in their brand term, 
and it was an ad that promoted their newest logger, you know, whatever that was. It was some sort of logger, and I, t I clicked on the ad and it was taken to this, like, I think it was a wheat logger or something like that. So clearly, there, you are allowed to advertise and promote alcoholic products. Yeah, it, it, it can just be pretty specific in terms of how that is displayed. Um, you know, if it's, you know, in, in that case, it was just, this is our newest product and, you know, it, there's no people, I, I didn't see the ad, but I would imagine that it might just be the name of the product and the look of the bottle, but there weren't any people in the ads. It didn't say like, you know, get drunk with our new logger. It was just, this is our product. Exactly. That's exactly yeah. right. Okay, good. So I think that's a good example of the Kind of there are some lines um, and to be very mindful when you're putting together a paid campaign that you can't, you know, you, 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 there are these restrictions where you can't necessarily, like you said, portray people that are getting drunk or, you know, whatever it is and be aware of that. So that's really good, it's really good information when, when these folks are trying to start thinking about paid campaigns. So, so excellent. Um, let's see, so, so kind of keeping that, and, and I will say that is a limitation because it certainly does hamper creativity, right? We all want to have really creative and, and, you know, unpredictable ads. So now we're a little bit hamstringed and that we have to be kind of careful with what we're doing, which is a, is a bummer on some levels. But I want to go ahead and, and ask you, Alex, kind of a more general question, um, which is, so most of the folks that are on the call and that are in this program, you know, are small business, <clears throat> small business owners excuse me, they're not, they don't have a lot, you know, of, of disposable budget to, to put into a paid campaign. So um, what would you say um, are kind of the prime considerations that small businesses need to consider when putting together a paid search or paid ad advertising campaign? What are the kind of the key things that they need to think about? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, in addition to really having a strong understanding of how, you know, what your budget is and how much you can afford. Um, after that, the first I would say is, you know, have a really good understanding of who your audience is. Um, is it a little bit more upscale of a brew pub, for example, or is it, um, you know, who are you trying to appeal this product and uh, this restaurant to? Um, where do they live? Uh, how much do they make? Because in the example of like Facebook, those are some ways that you can target those people uh, geographically by their interests, related interests as well. So if there is, um, you know, if there is a similar product, let's say it's like a food product or some other clothing product that you would kind of compare yourself on the on the level of, you know, how how upscale you are, um, you might be able to target people who like that similar food or who like that other brand. Um, and then after your audience, the, the next um, thing that you should really consider on a high level is, are your goals? Um, are you trying to sell cases of beer um, and how, to, how might you be wanting to get that sold? Or in the case of like a brew pub and a restaurant, are you just trying to drive, um, you know, people through your doors to come and sit down and eat and drink? Because um, then in that case, it might open it up to different types of uh, advertising. Excellent. And, and speaking about, I, mean, I, I preach this quite a bit, and I, I think that it is super important, this piece of knowing your audience, and I think that's a really great insight. And I, and I agree that when you're um, thinking about launching a paid campaign, you, you absolutely need to kind of target in, and the more you can refine that, probably the more qualified traffic you're going to get. Do you know of any tools, Alex, or, or methods or methodology around how you can kind of gain or garner some sort of research or data that's going to help you fine tune, um, you know, knowing your audience or like tar who you're targeting. Um, I think targeting is a key, is a key component, component to paid search. And um, do you know of any tools or, or, or ways that, that, that folks can kind of um, fine tune that targeting? Yeah, I would say that, um, you know, the, the first place that you could look is the tools themselves. Um, with Google AdWords, you can set up an account and you can actually use their tools um, even before you started launching an ad. It used to be that they ha would have some tools that were free and you didn't need to log in to use them, but now, that, now you have to have an advertiser's account on there. But what you can do is you can just create an account 
um, you know, maybe kind of make some little tests, you know, it's some sort of dummy, dummy campaign, but just have it pause so nothing's actually running and charging to a credit card. Um, but then you can use their tools and they've got some really great tools where you can look at uh, the different types of keywords that might, people might be searching for um, on, on the search side or even on the display side, you can get some, um, you know, some related websites and you can get a sense of, you know, how much traffic that these websites are getting if you're, if you're looking at running display ads. With Facebook as well, um, when you're going through the process of creating an ad, before you even get that ad launched, part of the, the ad building process is um, targeting your audience. So you can really start playing around with, you know, I wanna target people in this geographic location uh, with these interests. It might be um, related businesses, related brands, um, things that, you know, you want to associate your audience with your, with your business. And when you do that, it actually refines the number of people that the, your ad would be displayed to. So even if you're not actually going to show an ad at that time, you can get a sense that, you know, if I'm targeting in this region, um, in this age range, and with these interests, that is, you know, a potential of, you know, let's say like 100,000 people in the Portland, Oregon market. So you can kind of get a sense of who is, you know, who is in your market and um, how you might be able to target them. Uh, excellent. And I, I would just add to that, that I, especially with Facebook, if you are um, considering launching a paid campaign on Facebook, I would just, you know, have the expectation that, that a bit, like a, lo a large part or a huge time kind of time consuming part of that process is going to be setting up your targeting. I know I, I um, you don't necessarily think like kind of going through the process of picking, you know, who's going to see your ad might necessarily take up quite a bit of time, but frankly, honing that targeting and really fine tuning it and choosing the groups that you're going to be targeting on Facebook can, can it really can make or break the effect, effectiveness of the campaign. So I think it's always just good to kind of expect and plan that it's going to take some time. Don't try, you know, it's tempting sometimes you're just so eager to try to get an ad in place that you're going to rush kind of through this process and just click next, next, next. But just know that you want to sit back and, and, and really deliberately fine tune and choose the groups and pages and, and the people that you're targeting for those campaigns because it can it can really make a huge difference and it takes a bit of time. It's not it's not you know the, with the click of the button that you're going to get the the fine tuning that you're looking for. Yeah, okay. and especially with something like um, really quick, especially something like Facebook ads that are um, targeted to a smaller audience that's you know highly researched and very very specific tend to perform better than ones that. I'm going to target everybody in the state of Oregon that's on Facebook. Exactly. That's exactly right. Um, so, as we're, so let's, so let's move, um, tell me a little bit about Alex around uh, conversions. Let's talk about conversions. I know during my, my lecture component, I, I've talked about what the actions that we want people to take. And I want you to maybe talk us through some of the different types of conversions that paid advertisers are looking for when they're launching a campaign. Yeah, so depending on the platform, um, you're actually going to be able to measure different types of conversions. Um, if you offer the ability to, um, you know, purchase products, whether that's beer itself, which has, you know, a whole lot of other restrictions in terms of shipping alcohol, but let's say you have a lot of t-shirts and merchandise and things like that that you want to sell, um, Facebook and AdWords, you know, they offer, uh, tracking implementation where you can actually, you know, track that sale of like a t-shirt or a sweatshirt um, all the way back to that particular ad or that particular campaign that you might have been running. Um, you know, if if you're setting up like a brew pub and you're trying to get traffic through the door um, and you're running something on either Yelp or Groupon, for example, they get a little bit more uh, specific in terms of, you know, the estimated revenue that you might have been generating from those ads because then it's actually somebody um, you know coming through your door and spending money on food and beverages and things like that um, and that that's a little bit harder to trace especially with like Facebook or AdWords uh, somebody clicking on the ad or somebody clicking on a Facebook ad and then coming to your uh, restaurant and spending $50 on dinner that's something that really can't be traced that way 
uh, with Yelp, they try to estimate the amount of revenue that their product is generating for you. Um, and they get that through, through some of their internal data and the activity around your page. But then with Groupon as well, you know, there, you know, there's um, an analysis tool that comes along with being an advertiser on Groupon in terms of how many people have purchased it, um, you know, how many Groupons they purchased, which is a little bit closer to matching what your revenue is getting. Excellent. Um, so talk to me a little bit. So I know that um, from some of the paid search campaigns that I've run, you know, it can kind of run the gamut between, look, I just want to increase brand awareness. So really for me, I, you know, I, I, I may not even be looking for clicks on the ad. I just want to, I just want to get my brand associated with a specific term and I'm not necessarily even looking for people to click on the ad. I mean, that's kind of one, you know, end of the spectrum. And then you can go through maybe people, um, you know, they, they want the clicks and, you know, but they are, they're just looking for website traffic, right? They really don't give it, they don't care what necessarily people are doing once they get there, but they're just looking to increase traffic. Then maybe you might, you know, again, go, going down the spectrum, maybe there's a lead form where actually they're going to, to a forum where you're trying to get email newsletters, signups, and then maybe all the way kind of at this very end, very closest, if you will, to a positive ROI is what you just went over, which is this e-commerce selling merchandise. So there's a spectrum of conversions kind of going from brand awareness all the way to sales. Maybe talk to us a little bit about that and what your thoughts are around how effective a platform like AdWords is at meeting each of those goals. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I think a tool like AdWords um, on Google or even Bing to an extent because they have um, some search ads as well, um, AdWords can be a really great starting point in terms of brand awareness. Um, like you had mentioned before, you know, you were looking at a specific beer maker and then their ad was one of their, you know, newest products um, and it was a branded search. So at the very least, you know, you might be able to target your brand name um, or target competitors potentially. And that is something that would just kind of build your name um, because if, you know, if you're doing other types of promotion, whether it's, you know, like press releases, social media, um, you're just reaching out to friends and family um, and you're spreading this word of mouth, other people are going to be searching, oh yeah, what was that new brewery that just opened up or what was that new beer? Um, and they're trying to look for variations of your name. And even if on the, at the very least you have a Google ad for your name, uh, that takes up more screen real estate and you can really customize the ad to have what you want it to say. You can include, um, you know, with AdWords, you can include little extensions that go beyond just a regular text ad. You can include a map of where you're located. Uh, you can include a phone number. Um, in some cases, you know, you can even include additional links to like a menu or um, merchandise that you might have for sale on your website. Uh, with something like uh, AdWords and Facebook as well, uh, you then kind of switch into, um, you know, targeting again towards individual users. With Facebook, it's based off their interest, their, uh, you know, where are they located, things like that, and their age. Um, but with both Facebook and AdWords, you also have the ability to target people who have already come to your website um, through retargeting or remarketing as it's known. Um, so you're capturing those people who come to your website and then when they go to Facebook or they go to another website, you know, like Oregon Live, for example, is like the, the big news website in the state, uh, your ad would appear on those websites then. So you're kind of continuing that connection um, and you can, your ad can follow those people. And then with something like Yelp, it's, it's a very relevant targeted audience. People are looking for some place to go and drink or eat. And there's, uh, you know, there's an opportunity on Yelp to be um, a lot more present in their minds of, you know, I'm looking at it, I'm looking for some place to eat, and here's this ad that pops up with this new brewery. Um, so you can get closer along that uh, decision-making process. Excellent. And actually, that's a great segue because, um, to, into talking a little bit more about remarketing and retargeting. So this is a newer technique that Google AdWords just added to the mix. Um, and I know there are other companies that also offer this type of strategy, but maybe you can go a little bit more in depth around talking about um, this concept of kind of reaching out to people that have already been to your website and having an ad kind of follow them around and maybe talk about some of the, the benefits or the opportunities and then maybe some of the downfalls around this, this strategy. 
Yeah, so the, the basic way that remarketing works is that when somebody comes and visits your website, um, their browser gets a cookie attached to it. And so then you're able to, uh, AdWords or other platforms are able to track that cookie. And so then if you were to go to your BrewPub's website and then they go to, you know, they leave and they go to some other website, your ad then appears. So it kind of follows you as you're going through the internet. I, you know, you see this all the time when you go to like Zappos and you're looking for a new pair of shoes. Um, you know, right now I'm looking for a new office chair. So all the websites that I visit, even like ESPN, I see ads for office chairs, even though I haven't really found one yet. Um, so in that effect, you know, you might get the downside of people tend to think that it's a little creepy that you're following them online. And, you know, there's this ad for somebody that, you know, I don't want to see an ad. They just think that it's creepy that websites can follow them. Right. But on the, other, on the other hand, it can be really effective in terms of building that brand awareness. Because if somebody um, is just sort of, in, sort of interested and they're not ready to try out your new beer or your new restaurant, um, you can kind of keep reminding them that you're present, you're new. Uh, maybe it's some particular event that you're trying to promote and an ad might be effective that way. And it's a really great use of budget as well, considering the other type of display advertising that you can do through Google's, which is just based off of um, either contextual targeting. So you might target an ad that is like a beer connoisseur's, uh, on a beer connoisseur's website. And because the content of that website has to do with beer, your ad shows there. Um, but they might, they may not have heard of your new company or your new business, and um, so it's not as effective. Uh, remarketing can be a great way to use display advertising with a very tight budget. Excellent. Um, so let's move forward. So um, many of the the folks in the class are uh, are looking to really kind of increase their local search traffic. Um, they're interested in having a restaurant or a tasting room or a group pub, something where it's going to be very localized, right? They're going to want to reach out to the local community. So maybe talk to us about um, some of the best practices around using paid search tactics to help boost local traffic um, to their properties. Yeah, so I would say, um, you know, some of the latest tactics that you can use if you're really trying to target, you know, a very small local audience, um, both Facebook and AdWords allow you to target your ads down to a pretty specific um, uh, city and region in terms of where somebody is. Um, with AdWords and I believe Facebook as well, you can get down to very specific zip codes. Um, and with AdWords, for example, what you can do then if you're targeting, let's say in general, you're targeting the, the Portland, Oregon metro area. Um, if your brew pub is located downtown, and you're trying to first start build, you know, trying to first build your uh, audience around people who live downtown. With AdWords, you can actually have um, what's called a bid modifier. So let's say as a random number, you're bidding $1 for this ad. Uh, for people who live closer to downtown, you can bid, uh, let's say, you know, another 50% on top of that dollar, so then your bid would then be a dollar fifty, a dollar fifty, and you're being more aggressive to those people because it's closer to your restaurant versus somebody who lives, you know, maybe 20 minutes away in Hillsboro. Yeah, you're going to want to show that ad um, because they might be willing to drive out there, but it's a farther distance, and so in that case, your bid modifier might be minus 50 percent. So then, in, instead of paying a dollar, you're paying. 50 cents for that click um, because ads still going to show, but they may not be as relevant because they live a little bit farther away. And you can also target by device. So for one example is um, that you typically see with, you know, uh, paid search blogs and um, best practice articles, things like that is pizza is used a lot of time. Um, if somebody is searching for pizza and, you know, depending on the time of day, and it's dinner, um, if they're out and they're on the go and they're looking for a quick bite to eat, you can target by location and you can also target by device. So if somebody is looking on their smartphone for the latest pizza joint that's 
um, near them, you might be able to target somebody who is a little bit, you know, who is only, uh, let's say, a mile away. You can target them more aggressively and have a higher bid for somebody who is a mile away versus somebody who is 10 miles away. So that's another way that you can really target a hyper local audience. Excellent. Um, and talk us a little bit. So we've we've talked about this a bit in the previous week, but I, I, it's so important, I think, for these small, smaller kind of local search business models that I want to approach it again. Um, so the the I, I I don't think the importance of of Google Maps can be underestimated, right? Um, so talk to us a little bit around about um, you know the process. I know you have to claim your Google Maps listing and to optimize it, but then. Are, aren't there some paid opportunities within Google Maps where you can kind of pay to um, to show up for searches like Portland Pizza or Portland Brew Pub or whatever? Um, talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, so when you have um, a Google local listing, um, you know, there is definitely a whole other side of SEO that is just about Google. So it's very important to claim and optimize your profile, get reviews, get ratings, um, and provide as much information that you can because listings that have, you know, let's say 200 reviews and a four and a half, four and a half star rating, um, and you include everything from the hours that you're open, your happy hour hours, your uh, link to your menu, those types of listings can build more trust with people versus ones that are pretty blank and don't have any reviews or have poor reviews. So that's definitely the first place that you start. Um, but when you are searching for a local business, there's several areas that you can come up. There's definitely the regular organic search results that your listing will come up. Um, and, but then also some people um, go to Google Maps, either the website on their desktop computer or on their phone. And when they're searching for a particular restaurant, for example, uh, with Google Maps, you know, it's a little bit more relevant because that business might be um, starred in a different color on Google Maps, and there might be only one or two listings that are considered paid versus organic search results where you're looking for your local business, you might see eight to 10 local businesses. Um, with mobile devices, it's even more competitive because the screen is smaller, so there's a lot less real estate, and um, if you're targeting mobile devices, there might be only one or two advertisers, period, that show up uh, on smartphone ads or tablet ads in some cases. So, um, you know, smartphones and mobile devices can be a lot more competitive, whether that's, you know, regular organic search results or in uh, Google Maps app, for example, if you're using that on your phone. Excellent. Um all right, guys. Well, we're gonna. I'm gonna open up to questions and uh, from from you guys that are here watching in a moment. I do have just a few more questions, but start thinking about um, your own questions uh, around paid search or even social media paid search. So let's let's, let's transition a little bit on here, Alex, to to social media and all the paid options around social. Um, I want to ask you, do you typically, um, maybe you could first of all just kind of discuss some of the paid opportunities um, on social platforms like Facebook and Twitter, and then do you typically recommend these to small business owners? Yeah, I, so with Facebook, for example, um, there are several different options that you have. Uh, you typically see um, more self-service type ads. Um, these are the very basic ads that started with Facebook where it was along the right hand side when you're looking at your Facebook account and your news feed um, and they tend to be very basic. It's just a short little bit of text and an image. Uh, and then they slowly started expanding to other types of ads and the ones that you see more often now are the actual sponsored content. So if you, um, you know, let's say you're, you know, you're posting to your business's Facebook page and it's for an opening or it's for a new event um, or it's for a new product launch. When you publish that post, you have the option of boosting the visibility of that ad. And one of the things that is, I would say a little bit controversial, um, but it's understandable is that when you post something to Facebook, you're not going to get 100% reach in terms of everybody that likes your page because some people have a Facebook account and haven't logged into it in a long time. Um, 
Facebook has its own, you know, sort of newsfeed algorithm so that depending on the other user, you know, if they log in three days later, um, the algorithm is determined that your post is not as relevant anymore, so they don't get to see your post. So one option that you have is this post that you've published, you can pay to have it seen by more people, which it seems a little weird that, you know, I'm having to pay to people that I already, uh, that already like my page. Um, but one of the benefits with Facebook though also is that if you're publishing a post and you're paying to have it um, boost visibility, you can target friends of friends as well. Um, so these may not, these, these are people that may not have heard of your brand or have may not liked your page, but their friend likes your page. And so that's why the ad is visible to them. Uh, with Twitter, there's some other, you know, there's some other opportunities with um, sponsoring specific tweets or um, you know, if there's uh, popular hashtags, you can have sponsored tweets that are related to that specific hashtag, which might be relevant in the case of, you know, again, a, a very hyper local nature. If you have a particular citywide event that's going on, you might, and there's some hashtag that's associated with that event, um, you know, you might be able to get sneak some ads in there. I know one of the big ones here in Portland is the Oregon Brewers Brewers Fest that happens every summer. Um, and I can't remember from this past one if there was a hashtag associated with it or something, but you know, Twitter is growing a lot in use. And if people are using this hashtag and saying that they're going to the Brewers Fest um, at Waterfront Park, you know, you might be able to get some ads in there that um, are related to your business. Um, I mean, Facebook and Twitter are usually the big ones. There's a lot of other smaller niche um, opportunities with like Reddit and things like that. But really, if you're talking about users and brand awareness, Twitter and Facebook are probably where you're gonna have the most opportunity. Excellent, we've gotten a question. I believe it's from David. Yeah. Um, does Twitter have the same geographic targeting like Facebook or uh, is it just about finding a local hashtag? Um, I. I've never personally run a Twitter advertising campaign, but I believe they do have the same targeting options. Um, you know, that is probably something that I can double check. And I would imagine that after um, this course tonight, there is some sort of email or resources that we can um, link to various websites or have some of these questions that I might be able to look up. Um, well, and that is something that I can confirm. Confirm, Alex, that absolutely Twitter does have the same geographic. Oh, okay. um, so you can really micro micro target in the same way that you can target um, on Facebook. Um, you can not only can you geographically target by city or county or state, um, mm -hmm. then you can also then add uh, upon that um, kind of you know choosing the followers of a particular account. So I was giving an example in, in my lecture materials. Um, like there's at, you know, at Rate Beer, and Rate Beer is a beer directory and they have, I don't know what, 20,000 followers or something. So you could actually run a, a campaign that says, hey, I just want, I just want to target, you know, the, um, the Portland, you know, the po Portland based followers of at Rate Beer and of the 20,000, got, you know, whatever that number is, maybe it's a thousand people that are actually in Portland that follow at Rate Beer on Twitter. You can target that very finite group for your sponsored tweet? So the answer is absolutely, you can. Awesome. Yeah, good question. Um, and I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Alex, but- um, Oh, no problem. So let's um, talk to you a little bit about what you would see as some of the, the benefits of advertising on a social platform versus paid advertising on Google AdWords. Yeah, um, I would say one of the first benefits that you get is, um, you know, in the case of AdWords and specifically search ads, um, you typically don't see it as much with restaurants or, you know, local businesses. You do, it depends on what the business is um, because there's a lot of other options available. With like local restaurants, for example, they can, they, they can go to Yelp, they can go to Facebook um, because they're looking for their friends, they're looking for reviews, um, they're, you know, they're looking at Google local businesses. Um, so I, you know, just before this course tonight, you know, I was just kind of looking around and I was looking at different Portland area restaurants that I know of and trying different, uh, 
you know, keywords to search for, and I didn't really see any ads that show up. Um, so if you're targeting a local, uh, you know, a very local market, um, something like Facebook or Yelp, where there is a more relevant audience can be a lot more effective because that's where the conversation is happening. Um, somebody who's going to Google and searching for a particular restaurant, you know, they might just be looking for the address and they're, they're sending that to Google Maps or something, or they're just looking for the phone number to, to call and make a reservation. Um, but if it's, you know, if you're trying to generate new business and build brand awareness, that's where social media, uh, you know, social advertising can come in. Where AdWords can get effective is with the, like the, re, the, the remarketing and the display ads like we were talking about earlier, um, because that is a way to build, a, you know, build awareness um, and connect with people when they leave your website. Excellent. And um, let's let's talk a little bit more about Yelp. I, we had a great question in our last live session where one student um, was talking about this whole pay to play concept where they had had a bad review about something and, and um, you know, you, despite the fact that there had been several positive reviews to the same restaurant or brew pub, um, Yelp still kept the bad review, you know, front and center. Um, and, and you know, at some some level, it felt like a, a extortion, right? Where where Yelp's like, look, pay us, and we'll take that down. And I know there are like a multitude of lawsuits and whatnot. How all that being said, whether on principle you you like Yelp or not, Yelp does offer um, local businesses a lot of opportunities with advertising and creating offers. So talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah. So on a on a basic level, um, if somebody is looking for a particular type of food or um, you know, a, a restaurant near them and they're looking at the style of food, you know, you might see one or two businesses that can show up and are advertising for that particular um, category and, and type of cuisine. Uh, and then in another area where ads can appear is where, you know, if you're looking at another restaurant, another technically another competitor in town, um, or if it's a related business, you can have an ad show on that actual Yelp listing. So I was just looking at a few breweries um, before this because Yelp actually just recently changed the layout of their business listings. Um, and, I was, and, and I was looking at in some various breweries in the city and I was actually seeing an ad for Starbucks because you know there's Starbucks on almost every corner and they were, the ad focused on what was the nearest Starbucks to this particular restaurant that I was looking at. Wow. But one of the other benefits though, if you're running advertising on Yelp is that um, nobody else can advertise on your listing. So if you have advertising um, on any budget with them, uh, it, they sort of, they, they basically close off your Yelp listing and nobody else who is running advertising can have an ad display on your listing. Oh, that's pretty compelling. Yeah, and then and then one of the things that I'll say really quick is because this is something that came up um, with a local business client recently, and I don't know if this is what you had talked about um, in, in the previous course with Yelp and the hidden reviews and things like that. Um, a lot of times, what happens with those reviews is that you know you see a lot of local businesses trying to um, build reviews and ask their customers for reviews, which is fine, but a lot of the times that that those reviews get filtered is because, um, you know, that user may have just created an account and they haven't built up any trust with Yelp. So if, you know, what, when they don't filter reviews is when somebody has a profile picture in their page and they filled out all of the profile information and they're reviewing 10, 20 businesses in the city versus a brand new account that was created just so they can review your restaurant. Um, that is not trusted by, as much by Yelp. Right, exactly. This whole concept of authority is the same, it's almost the same as like a Google, you know, the Google algorithm of how they rank websites. I mean, you know, yeah, exactly. If, if the, the reviewer has one or two reviews, it's not going to nearly be weighted as heavily as a power reviewer that has 40 or 50 or 60 different reviews for all different things that have been around for years and years. And um, that makes sense. I mean, you know, granted. Yeah. <clears throat> so, okay, guys, I'm going to open it up. We've got um, just about 15 or 20 minutes left to, to make it to our hour. And there are a few of you um, that are here. Thank you so much for coming tonight so that we're not talking to an empty room. Certainly appreciate that. 
So let's type in, type in some questions. Now is the time. If you have any questions, to type them in. Alex is here and, and myself to, to answer any questions that you might have. So, all right, Erin, um, it seems like that more often than not, that, um, that the person that has 20 reviews on Yelp, 19 are negative. Okay, Erin. So, Erin, we're still kind of back to this concept that, you know, that Yelp is, a, is kind of a, is gaming the system, if you will. Um, and I, I don't, I don't argue, necessarily argue with that. I, I, um, Alex, have you, have you have any latest updates around kind of where these lawsuits are or, or what's happening on that side of it? Have you read anything about that lately? Um, and yeah, that... people are more negative. I mean, people are, do tend to, I think, be more negative than positive typically in these reviews. I agree with you. Yeah, in general, and that's not just with Yelp, that's with Google as well. Um, if people have a bad experience, they, they tend to share that experience more than a positive one, and a positive one might be more word of mouth with their friends. Um, and w just a quick side note with uh, Yelp and reviews and things like that, and one of the things that I always tell clients at their local business is that, you know, if you're if you're providing a great product and a great service and you have a lot of great reviews, one or two negative reviews isn't gonna hurt your business entirely because as long as you know you have 20, 30 positive reviews um, and somebody sees one negative review, um, I, I can't remember the exact numbers, but there was basically sort of this uh, user study that showed that people saw that one negative review as that's somebody else's opinion and they might have just been having a bad day. So that's another little side anecdote about reviews. Yeah, and I completely agree that and I see that in my own behavior where I'm, I'm, I shop on Amazon and I also, you know, if, I, if I'm traveling, I'll check out um, restaurant reviews in different cities. And I, and I do kind of skim and kind of look at the trend, right? So you know, if there are 100 reviews and, and most of the ones that I read are positive and then you get that weird, like odd, one star, this place sucks thing, I, it's very easy for me to dismiss that in light of like 10 other reviews that are very positive. Whereas, you know, the opposite thing where it's like, oh my gosh, if all of a sudden there's one, two, three, four kind of semi-negative reviews and that becomes much harder to ignore. So I completely agree with that, Alex. And um, ultimately, again, it's just, it just comes down to the same concept that your that your service and your product, your customer service, your customer experience have to be on point every single time, you know, and 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 really hope that you're giving them that, you know, take it to eleven experience, so that they're going to write something positive about you. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, and then with Yelp in particular, um, and you know, a lot of the controversy that they have kind of surrounded themselves with. Um, I know that in the past, some lawsuits have been dropped and you always hear sort of rumors of, um, you know, this is another business that has been complaining about Yelp and their extortion. But really when it comes down to it, it's kind of a he said, he said, or he said, she said type situation. And, you know, basically Yelp has sort of built it in their policies and in their terms and conditions that you know, it, it, it's pretty hard for them to be prosecuted. Um, in my opinion, it, it's going to take it's going to take a lot of effort and something that's probably not likely to happen. But somebody might, in, in my opinion, somebody would have to record a phone call with their Yelp sales rep, and the Yelp sales rep is literally saying, "Yes, this is extortion," and they've got it on tape, and they go to court with that. Whoa. Which is unlikely to happen. I, you know, I'm sure that these sales reps have have been in internal trading meetings with Yelp's lawyers about how to talk to businesses, and it would be pretty hard to bait that out of them. Right. Exactly. Which was sort of the, what we came to on, our, you know, the point on the last call that it, as much as it's a very bitter pill to swallow. Yeah. Um, at the end of the day, it's like, God, you know, the 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 but the return on investment of just paying, you know, whatever it is that they're asking in order to get that, you know, positive review bump to the top. It, you know, yes, and it kills me to say this, but at some level, it's kind of like you just need to surrender um, and and do it. I, I don't know. It's 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 tough, but I I agree with you, Alex. Like actually finding that, you know, is is that the battle that you really want to fight? Right? Is that really the battle? Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Excellent, Aaron. Aaron is recording his next conversation. Do it, do it, do it. 
Um, all right, guys, any other, what, what other questions do we have? Um, come on, this, so this is your chance. Okay, what about TripAdvisor? David, coming out with a great question. Uh, TripAdvisor seems like a good platform to position yourself in touristy areas. Um, Alex, do you have any, any uh, experience with TripAdvisor? Um, not as much. Um, I mean, I know that it's along the same lines as Yelp um, in terms of the reviews and the ratings that you can have. Um, I do know that they have, um, you know, you can have a basic account that they might have created based off other uh, local business data that they might have gone from Google or somebody else creating that because, you know, for like Yelp or Google listings or TripAdvisor, if, if there's a new restaurant that's not on that platform, I, you know, anybody can create that business page and it's just not claimed. Um, but with TripAdvisor, I'm, I know that they do have sort of a paid listing option where you can have an enhanced profile um, and you can, you know, Ex, you know, you can include more information about your business that might be menus and things like that. Um, so that, you know, they do have a, a paid option where you just have a, a bigger presence in terms of your page and more photos and, and there might be some video with that, but not as much activity on TripAdvisor. I think it kind of goes back though to local business in general where you're trying to have the, you know, the best customer experience, um, happy customers, and they are leaving reviews on their own on your business. Right, and I would, I, I think that sounds that I agree with that completely. Um, and I, and I would also say, David, that this comes into, um, it really depends on where you are and what percentage of your business you kind of foresee as being tourists. Like, you know, I, I'm thinking about, for example, maybe a, a New Orleans or. Um, you know, even in Portland, where now I feel like we are getting more and more tourists, and and we are known. You know, Portland's known for for its its craft brew, and it, there's a whole beer, you know, uh, beer pub, pub crawl, if you will. Kind of, I think it was sort of originated here. Um, so so if you anticipate that you're in a location where a, a good portion of your Washington D.C. if a good portion, of, okay, you're in Washington D.C. Well, that's a huge tourist town, right? I love Washington. I'm from that area. I don't know if Washington DC is necessarily known for brew pubs, probably not, um, but Washington gets a shitload of tourists, especially during the Cherry Blossom Festival and whatnot. So if you know that a big portion of your, your pe you know, people that are coming are going to be tourists, then absolutely I think it would behoove you to include these types of platforms that tourists are in. So you know, I might not, I might, I might be coming to DC and um, maybe I'm on TripAdvisor, not specifically to find a brew pub, but I'm on TripAdvisor to find my hotel or to find interesting things to do, then absolutely it would be very relevant to have, you know, your brew pub among one of the things that I can do. I can do beer tasting when I'm in DC. That'd be really cool, especially if I'm coming from Portland and I'm used to these places that have flights of beer. You know, maybe I want that same experience in a different city. Um, so I think there's some potential there, but it really depends on where you are. But great, good question. Yeah, and I just did a quick look on TripAdvisor's website, um, and it looks like they have more of a, a direct buy opportunities where, um, you know, you can download a media kit, <clears throat> and they've got some they've got some opportunities here with um, display advertising, and they list um, some of the, the IAB, the International Advertising Bureau or board, um, which pretty much sets the restrictions in terms of how big display ads can be. Um, and so then they have some examples and some media kits of homepage ads. Um, you know, it looks like you can target users by specific city, state, or country. Um, so there are some additional advertising options on, on TripAdvisor, but it's more of a, a direct buy. I would imagine that you have to get in contact with the sales rep and work out a deal with them. Um, so Theo has a question. What do you think about yeah. QR scans for marketing? So um, great question, and I'm assuming you, you mean uh, this concept of the QR code where you can take your mobile phone and scan a code and you're going to be given some sort of information. What are your thoughts on that, Alex? Yeah, um, QR codes, uh, it's kind of one of those interesting cases where it had a lot of potential, but it didn't really grow as much as it could have. Um, um, because, it, it, in my opinion, QR codes are almost dead nowadays. Um, and the other aspect of it is NFC tags, which is basically just touching your phone 
next to something that's NFC near field communications enabled. Um, so, in, and so you can touch two devices or uh, a phone to a poster that might have a QR um, chip, I mean, not a QR, but an NFC chip in it, and it happens a lot faster. But even with that, you know, there is, um, you know, there's a, you know, there's a lot of question about, you know, that still takes time for somebody to, um, you know, pull out their phone and with QR codes, pull up the photo app or pull up their QR app that they have and scan it with NFC. In some cases, you actually have to load up an, uh, an app again and just to activate the, the scanner, um, to activate the, the chip in whatever, what else, whatever else you're trying to tap. It can be a poster or another phone. Um, I would say that there's greater opportunity, again, in terms of, you know, targeting by users in a hyper-local hyper market. Um, with uh, a platform like Foursquare, for example, um, you know, you have an option there by, if somebody is just walking down the street and they pass a restaurant, um, I don't know specifically if you can advertise to have this, but Foursquare will give you a push, a, a push notification that you just walked by this restaurant and because you have checked into other restaurants in the area or other brew pubs in, in, in Portland, you just walked by a brew pub, so we're going to recommend this brew pub to you. And if you have notifications active on Foursquare, you get that push notification to your phone. And so that idea of geolocation and push notifications, I would think has um, greater opportunity than something like QR codes. Yeah, I think I would absolutely agree with that, Alex. And I might push back to you, Theo, around um, how, what were you thinking, or how were you thinking about using the QR code? Um, I completely agree with Alex. It, 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 I think initially, marketers, especially like print advertisers and people that have print publications were hopeful that including these QR codes into their print materials would be a way that they could kind of revive this, the print media and, and kind of you know, integrate digital with print, right? You have a QR code, you're in a magazine, you've got a QR code around a product, you scan it with your phone and it's going to take you to some online experience. Um, but my experience has been quite frustrating. I, I don't, I get frustrated because I either I have to download a whole new app to, to scan the code properly. You know, there's no you know, industry standard code. It's, it's just complicated. There are a lot of different clicks. It's, it's not right now. It's just not the best user experience. The, I, I think that though, however, um, you know, people and pe marketers who are using the QR codes are getting smarter and there are some really great uses for it. For example, um, I, I, there's a good, you know, if, if you're at a conference um, and you, you have your phone and you're trying to find your way around some big conference like a Dreamforce or some huge conference um, and there's a code you can scan that's going to pull up, you know, a map of all the locations and give you real-time information, that can be a real, uh, that could be very compelling and, you know, real-time kind of valuable use of the QR code, but more often than not, I have found it to, that, that, that it's kind of gratuitous. Um, and you're, uh, yeah, okay, well, good. Well, well hopefully we're, we're having a general discussion around QR codes. I mean, the one time that I, you know, I've actually scanned, so I, um, well, and I was just about to say, and now I'm kind of defeating my own story here by saying, um, <laughs> like the one time that I actually did scan something that went, well, I, I've scanned multiple things on QR codes that have been useless. Let me just say, and I think that has ultimately resulted in me kind of being a little bit jaded and cynical around QR codes. However, that being said, there was one time that it was really cool, and I don't know why this was cool to me, but I got this banana. It was like this really cool, dull, organic banana, and the banana was really, really good, and it had a tag on it, and on the back of the tag, it had a QR code, and, and the banana was so darn good, for whatever stupid reason, that I actually, and, and because I'm a marketer, and I was interested in what, what where the QR code was going to take me, I actually scanned the thing and took the time, and it was kind of a cool experience. Granted, it didn't, you know, it, it took me, it told me the farm in, you know, wherever it was, Costa Rica, where the banana was harvested and, you know, basically told me the name of the dude that was harvesting the banana. And it was, you know, granted, it was very Portlandy or whatever, but it was really interesting. Um, and it, it, it provided some, some, a story around this banana that tasted so good, right? So in that point, and, and it was, it didn't necessarily do anything valuable, but it told a story that for whatever reason resonated for me. Um, so yeah. there you have, um, you know, that's, so, so there can be value, but I think you have to be careful. And yeah, and, um, 
Um, but yeah, right, exactly. They they are cumbersome and, and, and they are they do tend to be all over the place. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, and I was just gonna say, um, I mean, so it's it's pretty clear about how effective QR codes. Um, but but, but when we are um, when we were talking earlier today, you know, I wanted to make sure that we got in this topic because I don't I don't think you had gotten to the question yet. But um, I wanted to make sure you know we can just take a few minutes to talk about you know some of the other opportunities with like Groupon or Living Social um, because that wasn't a question that come up. I I thought somebody would have asked about that question. Um, so, in the case of like Groupon or Living Social, which, um, you know, in, in some cases you can see it as a, an effective way to drive traffic and people into your restaurant or brew pub, for example, um, but then you also see some people say that like Groupon is, is dying and they're, you know, when they went public, their stock price is going down. Um, if anybody is interested in looking at these sort of local deal platforms, uh, one of the things that I will say is that they they can be effective if you use them the right way. Um, first, you've got to fully understand their rules in terms of you know what they charge um, and what they might give back to you in terms of revenue. And you also have to be very clear about what rules you're offering to the customers. Um, you know, what, it, you know, is that, how much are they purchasing, whether um, other, you know, whether other services are included, uh, you know, dates that this can be used. And, you know, I still subscribe to Groupon and Living Social, um, and I, st I, I probably see more often uh, deals for restaurants and brew pubs and things like that than I do uh, Yelp advertising or even like AdWords display ads or even Facebook ads. Um, and I think I think another thing to be aware of with these local deal platforms is that there can be too much of a good thing and it gets to a point where it kind of dilutes your business. Um, well, you know, one of the examples that I'll give is uh, Cinetopia, which is a, a movie theater chain here in the Portland area where it's like, you know, really expensive, high quality theater where, you know, you can actually buy a beer and you can have like a, a burger actually inside the movie theater and it's really big plush leather chairs. Um, living, uh, Cinetopia kind of built their business on having, you know, like their 18, 20, $25 tickets to a show when you're trying to watch a movie. And it, the place got too expensive so that, you know, probably one of the only ways that I ever see business. And when I do go to Cinetopia, everybody in line, and this is 20, 30 people in line, they all have Groupons. So that kind of shows me that that's the only way that people are going to Cinetopia is with Groupon and it kind of cheapens your brand and your company a little bit. So, you know, if, if you're just starting out and you're trying to generate some new business, you might consider doing you know, a group on one month and then waiting a couple months and then doing a living social um, and just, just to test how it goes. But uh, be absolutely careful about how you do it um, and, you know, whether that's effective or not. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. And I think, you know, diluting the power of your brand is an issue. Um, you know, and and do you want? I mean, there's this whole group of of you know coupon clippers and these people that are really looking for a deal. And are you know is what you are offering um, relevant enough for them and and sticky enough for them that they're going to continue to come back time and time again without that discount? Right. That's part of the, mm -hmm. the question. You don't want to get a, a troop of discount seekers coming in um, and that and then they you know go away. And I mean, from my perspective, yet the, the, the boost of um, a Groupon is that you're going to get lifetime customers, hopefully, right? Not just the one-time coupon clipper. Um, and and I agree with Alice. I think you do need to be careful, especially around something like craft brewing, which is, you know, there, it's, just, it's an artisan product on a lot of levels. I mean, many of you are, are producing something in, in small batches that's kind of more artisanal. And do you want to kind of, like Alex said, to kind of cheapen that with, you know, a buy one entree, get one entree free kind of crowd and, and other people who maybe are coming in who aren't part of the Groupon crowd, is that going to, how is that going to impact their their vision and, and their interpretation of your brand? So I think it is something to be done very mindfully. 
Okay. Yeah, and, and an example of where it might be effective is um, I've never actually purchased it, but I see it um, published every once in a while. Is, you know, you, Portland has a, a really growing number of local distilleries, um, and in for some of those distilleries, they offer like a free tour, um, and you know, you can tour all of their facilities, and you know, you might be able to get a, a few tastings. Um, but then their price point might be a little higher, and um, you know, after the tour, they get you into their shop and you might spend $40, $50 on a bottle of vodka, which I've done the tour and I've, I've bought in the bottle before because it's a really great product. But there's another distillery in Portland where um, they offer us kind of like an experience package where you get a tour of their distillery and you get some product. Um, and so instead of, you know, buy one entree, get one free, it's more of the experience about learning their company um, and learning their products. And it includes the tasting. It includes the little tasting glass. Um, I think it might have included a T-shirt. I can't remember exactly. Um, so it's, it, you know, they're, you, they were using Groupon or Living Social, whatever it was, more for the experience and building up their business. And then I would imagine that, you know, they still, the last point on the stop of the tour is their gift shop and you can buy their bottles, but it was more about the experience. Excellent point, Alex. Um, and that can be a, a very compelling way to get the story out to a group of interested people that, that may not otherwise learn about you. Um, so you guys, we're, we're rounding out our hour. Um, I'm going to give one last call for any additional questions. And if there aren't any, I'm going to um, thank Alex for being here um, and thank all of you who are here watching um, for your time on a Wednesday night. It's rainy, awful Portland night here, wet and dark. Um, but we'll be back. I will be back next week, week seven. We're going to be talking about social media, and we have another live session scheduled for week seven. So any other last-minute questions? Anything? Anything? Not seeing anything come up. All right, well, Alex, thank you very much. I appreciate your All right, you're time. very welcome. Have a um, great night, everybody. Excellent, yes, everybody have a wonderful night. Thanks, David, thanks, Justin, thanks, Aaron, thanks, Reese. Um, I'll see you guys all soon. Have a wonderful week. Bye. Thank you.